Hi from Speak More Clearly. Today we have a very special guest, Kristen Espinar, and I'm really excited to have her here with us. Kristen Espinar is an IELTS coach, author and podcaster who helps IELTS candidates get a 7 plus band score in IELTS writing and speaking skills. She has been an ESL and exam coach for 15 years and has a master's degree in applied linguistics and has been an official scorer for TOEFL exams and others for the past seven years. She's the founder of Activate Your IELTS, the online IELTS prep academy, as well as the Activate Your IELTS podcast. So fantastic to have you here. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I do everything. <laughs> yes, it's really brilliant. I'm really pleased. <laughs> okay, so just to get us started, um, would you mind telling us a bit about yourself and your company, even as well how you got interested in, you know, language acquisition and spe especially the, the special IELTS coaching that you do as well with students? Sure. So I guess I'll kind of start from the beginning, if you don't mind, yeah, um, give you my little story. But um, <laughs> so I, well, I always liked learning languages. Um, and even as a little girl, I wanted to learn a second language. And as I grew older, that became kind of like my first um, bucket list goal. Like, no matter what I do in this life, I'm going to learn a second language. So I dedicated myself to Spanish and um, I started traveling the world. And then eventually I realized that I wanted to, um, or one way that I could really spend time in another culture would be to start teaching English. So I began teaching English abroad in 2006 and I got certified and, you know, began teaching and learning Spanish in, in Spain. And um, you know, I really loved it. I had a good mentor and I really fell in love with teaching. So I began to do my master's degree in applied linguistics, which was really great because it gave me like the, the theory behind the practice of what I was already doing. Mm -hmm. And because I was already doing that, I was able to see, um, like how it fit into the theory really well. So applied linguistics made a lot of sense to me. And my program was really focused on ESL um, education as well. So there was a lot of activities that were focused on that. And um, so during my time in Spain, I lived in Spain for like seven years and I lived in Russia for one year too. Wow. Um, I did a lot of exam like practice preparation because in Spain everybody's really into the Cambridge exams like first certificate uh, Cambridge advanced and proficiency although I think they've they've changed their names so that's where I got all of my exam prep experience I mean I was just every day like class after class of exam prep experience and I realized that I really loved it because it's hard teaching academic English academic English is different from what you learn usually in a general English class. Mm. Mm, right definitely yeah definitely yeah so it requires different strategies and I, it's more challenging and I, and I think it also leads to more success mm -hmm. when you're able to master those skills because it leads you to better things like a, a better job being able to immigrate um, you know you can just being better at English in, mm. in formal settings. Mm. Mm. So that kind of became my passion. And when I moved back to the States, we, um, I got married in Spain and we moved back to the States and I started teaching um, at universities, basically the same skills that you need to pass TOEFL and that sort of thing. And eventually I decided to start my own online business, um, working with academic language and exam preparation because that's my passion. Mm. And, but I decided to start the podcast because it's really hard to get found online. Tell me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't do like a blog or a podcast. Yes. So, um, I started the podcast and, and I remember the first time I did it, I thought, you know, I wonder if anyone's interested in, in what I have to say. And, um, people were, you know, and, and it's, it's been pretty successful. So it's a really, that's a really good resource for anybody that is interested in IELTS prep. I focus mainly on writing and speaking because it's the productive skills, which are the skills people are struggling with. They're not 
um, getting the scores that they need and it's what's holding them back. So yeah. if, if you do need a free resource for writing and speaking, my, um, my podcast is called Activate Your IELTS. You can find it anywhere you listen to podcasts or on my website at kristinespinar.com forward slash podcast. Yeah. But it's, and we'll also put links on this yeah. video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then, well, and then we did that interview and that's coming out soon too. So um, I've yeah. got about 115 episodes with a ton of information. So <laughs> that's great. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we often get people um, who actually, so it's really great that we've connected because we often get people who say, oh, can you help us with the writing? And we don't do writing. We do pronunciation oh, and clear speech and accent neutralization. But that's really good that we've connected because up till now we haven't had anyone to say, well, this person can help you with your writing as well yeah. as what you have to do to prepare for the speaking section, right. especially in these right. ex different exams, the Cambridge, the TOEFL, the whatever they're called, the IELTS, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, I definitely work with both writing and speaking, but I would say writing is more my um, speciality because mm. that's the area that students really get stuck with. Mm. Um, that's where it's, it's easier to get a seven in speaking than it is in writing. Yes. So that's where I end up working with people. And I would say the people that come to me, they come to me because they're very frustrated. They've, they're taking the exam four times. They're stuck at a six, a 6.5. They don't know why yeah. they need somebody to tell them. Yeah. And because, yeah. um, you know, I've been an examiner for TOEFL for like seven years and, and other official exams within the educational testing service with writing and speaking, yeah. I'm very good. I've got an examiner's eye, so I know what examiners are looking for. And it takes me just one minute to say, yeah. okay, this is your, this is your problem. And yeah. this is what you need to do. That's brilliant. Cause you need somebody who can see it from that side as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's really if you're great. struggling. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. Wow. Really great. Okay. So today our, our topic was going to be how to improve your IELTS score. So that leads into it very well. Um, so I, I, I have a few questions here. Um, and again, our, um, often our people who come to us for accent reduction, pronunciation, speaking clearly English, being understood because so they don't have to repeat themselves 50 times, which is very frustrating also. Um, but they often say, well, we want to move to another country or we want to be able to speak English clearly, or we have to get into university or all of that stuff that needs the seven plus um, band IELTS score. And mm -hmm. so I'd like to ask you, how do you help prepare people for the IELTS test? That's just to start with, I have a few more mm -hmm. questions as well. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, my services basically are IELTS coaching, IELTS writing correction, um, and I do some self-study courses as well. And I think I'm going to do a hybrid course in like September, October, which will be um, delivered through like videos. So they'll have self-study um videos and then we'll we'll get together once or twice a week and kind of do like a workshop to work through the concepts so that's the first time and i'm going to try that as like a group coaching yeah. um but i find that I, I really like to try to do self-study but i find that most people get the most value out of coaching because they like to um get the feedback and i think that actually is the key that helps people move forward, especially when they're stuck, yeah. is they get the instruction, which could be, you know, a video or it could be me telling you, and then they do the practice and then they get the feedback. And so usually that's what I do in the class is I'll give them instruction, I'll give them a task, the next day we'll start with the task, review it, and I'll say, okay, you're doing well here, but this is where you're going wrong, try this again. Yeah. So it's that cycle of writing it again and again and trying the concepts and getting them on track, which helps them move forward. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I think it's necessary because y even if you have the strategies like from YouTube or blog or whatever, um, you don't know if you're putting them into action correctly yeah. and you could be doing it totally wrong and yeah. have no idea. And so yeah. it really helps to have somebody like keep you on that path. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. And that immediate feedback is so important. And also the examplers. 
So you're going, okay, here's how it needs to be written. And then that you give them that example so they know where yeah. they're headed. So that's really good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And where they're going wrong. That's great. Um, so uh, do you mind if I say one more thing yeah, about please, that? Please, please. Yeah. Uh, so another thing that is interesting is I do writing corrections and I've seen students get like improve quite a bit only through doing writing corrections. Okay. So it depends on each student. Each student has their own path. Some students really need like that step-by-step -step instruction, but others can just kind of take your, you know, the feedback, the direction that you give them and go with it. In yeah. fact, um, my most recent podcast episode, I think, number 114 is one of my biggest success stories where I had this student, she took um, only 10 writing corrections with me. We never met. I usually tell students to take this video course with it, but she didn't do it. And she went from a five to a seven wow. in only 10 corrections. It was, wow. I was, I was <laughs> like, wow. So yeah. she really got it. And some students only need just a little bit of help. Mm -hmm. Whereas others really need to be, um, you know, guided and it just depends who you are, how fast you learn, yeah. you know, what, what your journey is. Yeah. And we find the same thing. I find the same thing that, um, you'll have some people where they work with our online course themselves and it's enough and they actually move themselves really quickly to be clearer and others who really need the one-on-one -on -one feedback and the really the coaching because they really are not able to modify what's going on in their mouth. So yeah, yeah it depends on the person. Yeah. But that's good. Yeah. You have all of that available. Yeah. Sometimes it feels like too much, yeah. but, um, <laughs> But I think with yours, it, it, it sounds harder to get people on track because of the, how the accent and having to move their, figure out how to move their mouths differently. To me, that sounds harder than showing them how to write a good essay. So yeah. I think you have yeah. the bigger challenge. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, um, what are the most common mistakes people make? Okay. So, um, can I talk about three things? Can I talk about grammar, speaking, and writing? Yeah, yeah, please, because people need to know that you do all of that. That's why, yeah. yeah. So actually, if you think about it, you know, you can break it down to the IELTS marking criteria. And what I said before is everybody's on their own journey. So if you think about um, like writing, for example, then you have to consider the marking criteria first. And you have to think, you know, am I, how am I doing in topic development, which is essentially task achievement, or how am I doing in structure, which is essentially coherence and cohesion? Mm -hmm. How am I doing in uh, lexical resource, which is vocabulary? How am I doing in grammar? Mm -hmm. Everybody is going to have their strengths and weaknesses. So some people have a weakness in grammar. Mm -hmm. And if the weaknesses in grammar, the most common errors and mistakes that I see are what I consider to be simple grammatical structures. And they kind of, um, if you make one of the errors, you tend to make all three, which yeah. is with articles. So definite, indefinite articles like a, an, or the, um, uncountable nouns, and then subject verb agreement. Mm -hmm. And this is because uh, all languages kind of have a, a different set of rules for mm -hmm. articles. Mm -hmm. Some have similarities to English. Some don't have articles at all. Some have similarities, but differences. Some just completely use them differently. And when you have a mistake with articles, then you have, you, you're usually going to also have a mistake with these uncountable nouns and then the subject verb agreement. But if you look at how, like, like the, the order of how we learn grammar, those are very low structures, like what you should learn in beginning and elementary level. So if you're making those errors on the exam, it's definitely going to bring your score down, at least in uh, the area of grammatical range and um, accuracy. And that, if you have a problem with that, then you have a, I think, a longer path mm. to getting a seven plus band score because it's hard to fix your errors with grammar. Mm. Um, I feel like when we learn our second language, nobody learns it like very, you know, step by step, very perfectly. And there's always like holes and gaps mm -hmm. in your language. And so if you have those holes and gaps, it's hard to go fix them. Mm -hmm. It takes a longer time than just learning a structure or how to develop a topic. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to grammar, those are by far the three most common errors that I see. Now with writing and speaking, um, 
they're kind of similar. I think the biggest error is that people don't give themselves enough time to prepare, which yes. means they don't have enough to say about a variety of topics. Because for IELTS, you have to be able to talk about education, transportation, technology, the environment, like whatever globalization, crime and punishment, whatever they throw at you. And most people, their biggest complaint is they don't know what to say and they don't have the vocabulary to express that. And it's because they're not taking time to develop those topics. If you took a class for like a year, your teacher and the book that you used, a lot of those topics would come up. You would spend time talking about them, learning vocabulary related to them. But most people take IELTS in a panic. <laughs> like, yes. I, yes. I have to take it in three weeks. What do I yes. do? Yes, I, I have heard. <laughs> yes, people have said that to us too. Yeah. 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 So when that happens, you don't give yourself the time to truly develop the topics and then you won't have anything to say. And if you're not good at giving your opinion in writing or in speaking, then it's going to be very difficult. Now, I'm great at giving my opinion because I've been a teacher for 15 years and I've had to discuss every topic you can think about mm. in the classroom. Mm. So it's very natural to me. Mm. And that's what students need to do is they need to be aware of the topics and practice them so that they naturally feel comfortable giving their opinion on a variety of topics. Yeah. And then to do that, you need to use a structure. You, you can't just, you know, randomly spit everything out. <laughs> and that's what I usually work on inside of my courses is I teach a structure how to do that. Um, and, you know, some of the biggest mistakes students make is they think they'll just say everything that they can about the topic, but it's unclear, it's disorganized, the it's just kind of like random speaking and it's that makes it difficult for the listener. So, you know, not being aware of the topic, not using a structure and then not practicing. And I yeah. think students feel uncomfortable practicing speaking prompts on their own. Yeah. So they think like, well, I, I, ha I have a friend and I'm talking to her, but that's not what's going to happen on the exam. It's an academic formal situation mm. where you basically have to give like a, a mini speech. Mm. You're not practicing mini speeches with your friend. Yeah. You're not using academic vocabulary. And I bet you're not talking about transportation is <laughs> issues or the environment. <laughs> yeah. So even though it's uncomfortable, and I'm sure you run into this with your students mm. as well, mm. you have to practice speaking on your own, whether mm. it's recording or, or just delivering it a, a, a response to your, your husband or wife or yes. friend. Yeah, so. it's a different ball game. It's like writing an essay or writing a narrative. There's a structure to it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, definitely. And that's one of the things I specialize in in my classes. And, um, and I think it's really fun to work on that. Mm. And then with writing, it's pretty similar. I mean, um, when I do coaching, I always start with speaking. Well, I really start with vocabulary topic development. Then I go into the structure of speaking and then I kind of expand that into writing. So it's like the same problem where you're not aware of the topics. You don't have the vocabulary and you have to have very high vocabulary for writing. And, and you also have, have to have academic vocabulary. A lot of people are using phrasal verbs or idioms or just kind of simpler words instead of academic vocabulary. Yeah. And it just doesn't sound professional. Yeah. Um, but I also think people just don't know what the essay structure is. They don't know no. how to write an essay. <clears throat> no. So I, I mean, I bet in Australia that you had to write a lot of essays in when you were in school, but I think in other cultures, they don't do so much of the writing in educational settings. Is, yeah. No, we have a similar, pro yeah, we have a similar problem. They, show you once or twice <laughs> then they oh, really? expect you to know it <laughs> oh, really? which is a bit absurd yes I think it's improved since I went to school but they, they there's been this at complaint for a while that in oh the, wow yeah the higher levels of school they I think they've started to improve it a bit but I don't think they do the French are very good they they give you and they do and they do and they do and they do from what I've heard, but uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yes, a lot of people well, don't know how. Yeah, I mean, this is one thing I really like about the American educational system is that we're practical. So, mm -hmm. you know, we do things. We don't just have the theory. We give presentations, we have debate club, you know, we write essays and the concepts that I'm teaching, I remember learning in third grade. <laughs> and 
Like I remember that's when we started. Did I master it in third grade? No, not till college probably, but we started very young. Mm. And when I talk to my students, they many times have never written an essay in their own language. Mm. They've only done like multiple choice type answers Mm. for their test, their whole educational career. Mm. So that means they don't have the academic concept even in their first language. But it's pretty, yeah, but it's pretty easy to teach. Um, I would Mm. say that's probably the easiest part for students to get. Yes, yes. And then um, they have the added thing of, yeah, so once they know how to do the speaking and the structure, then they need to be clear as well. So they've got a lot to do, yes. (laughs) But it sounds like you, (laughs) no, it sounds like you structure it beautifully so that they know exactly where they're going. So that's really great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's important to have a path, yes. a clear path. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, um, how long, um, well, you've just answered how people can improve their score to a certain degree. You've said, you know, you need to do all this groundwork and have this structure so you know where you're going, what you have to do. Um, how long does it generally take? Although that's probably a question like how long is a piece of string and it also brings in the own the person's own abilities and previous yeah. education is that what you would say or yeah i would say everybody has their own path mm. um you know everyone has their own journey you have your own strengths you have your own weaknesses and then it just depends how easily you learn something and how you apply it and how hard you work at it as well mm. so each situation is unique but with IELTS, there's usually like a time limit, like I'm taking it in three months or I'm taking it in two months. Here's yes. my exam date. Yes. So we just try to hit that goal within that period of time. It's not always possible. Sometimes people come to me and say, I'm taking the test next week. What do I do? And it's, it's like, that's not enough time. To it's not going to work. Yeah. Yeah. It's not going to work. Yeah. So I would say I've, that I've had the same feel. thing happen. Yeah. 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 I can imagine. Yeah. And I would say the, the ideal time under pressure would be three months. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's a realistic timeline for somebody that's preparing for IELTS. Of course, I'd like for them to do longer. But, um, you know, I've seen students make um, massive progress in usually six weeks, you know, six weeks, eight weeks, six weeks to three months is usually yeah. the time that they need to really make, um, you know, that, that five to seven band score jump or whatever it is. I had yeah. one student who was very diligent. He started at a five. Um, he worked very hard for three months and then he improved by a band score and a half um, on exam day. So we got a yeah. 6.5 in writing and speaking. And I would say that's kind of, you know, what you could expect uh, yeah. to improve would be a band score to two band scores in, you know, Three, probably ten, six to 12 weeks. 12, yeah. Something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. 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 You've got to give it time because it's like anything. You've just got to be able to integrate it so you can use it. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's not like uh, something you memorize. It's, mm. um, something that you have to create and demonstrate. It's a skill. Mm. And that's what is hard. I think that's what people don't get. They think yeah. like, oh, I should just be able to do it. But yeah, no. you have to develop it over time. So yeah. it does take a bit of time. Yeah. I feel like I know what's going on inside their brain. And I know mm. their frustrations. I mm. know exactly what they're feeling and why. Because language mm. learning is like, that's the other thing is like, sometimes you grow really quick and then you kind of plateau yes. and feel stuck and then you yeah. grow. Yeah. And so yeah. I kind of understand that journey. And, um, and because I have the, the theory in my head, I, I also sort of know what's going on cognitively mm. when you're acquiring language or mm. making mistakes and why. And so I think all of that is really helpful to you know, helping them along on their journey because my goal is to do it as fast as possible. Mm-hmm. I try, I try to do everything to, you know, get them to the score that they need. And I think each person is also unique. So you have to kind of look and see like what, if they're not getting something that maybe other people usually do, like mm-hmm. why and how, how, how do you have to change your instruction and what can you do to try to, to help them with that. And I, I actually find that really interesting yes. because it's all about how we learn. Yes. So, and how we learn language specifically, which is, you know, linguistics. So. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> and when you think about it, your 
bedding down new neurology, basically. And that yeah. takes time. Mm -hmm. You know, those new pathways take time to be worn in and to be automatic. And yeah, so yeah. Uh, can I tell you a cool story about that? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, when you came on my podcast, it was in my head, but we didn't talk about it. Mm. So um, I was always terrible at math. And when I went to college, I had to do like remedial math. Mm. Um, and I did algebra and I had a very good teacher and I had a very good tutor mm -hmm. and I dedicated myself to learning algebra. And so I did all my homework. I went to the tutor every day, you know, and I actually began to like it because I felt like I was getting it and I was kind of paving that foundation that I was sort of talking about with grammar, but with mm. al algebra. Mm. And I remember after like three months of, of studying intensely, one night I went to sleep and I dreamt that my brain was like making all these connections, kind of <sighs> like downloading information. <laughs> yes. And I told, I woke up, I told my friend, I worked in this coffee shop with this guy who was like this brilliant guy who knew everything. And he was like, you were connecting synapses and making pathways and I still remember that. I, I think I did. And I, yes. I felt like I had more understanding, like a, after that, I had like a good strong basis for algebra after that. Yes. Isn't that brilliant? It's yeah. amazing. <laughs> yeah. So when you yes. were talking about that on the podcast, I was yes. like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. And when you think about it, when we learn language and when we learn write, to write our language, it takes years. You know, yep. so, so three months is not much to ask of somebody, you know? No, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so my next question for you is, um, well, you've probably, but, but we're going to tweak it a bit. What tips do you have specifically for speaking and pronunciation, the speaking and pronunciation section of the exam? I know you don't do pronunciation per se, but, you know, um, have you got some extra tips, you know, that sort of thing that we can um, go for there? Yeah. yeah. Sure. So for speaking, I mean, what you need to do basically is, is what I said already. You need yeah. to actually what I recommend doing is like going kind of thematically. So like one week um, do health. Right. And I would say start by picking a lot of different prompts, speaking prompts related to health. Then so then you kind of know the themes, like what are you going to be talking about, like mm -hmm. healthcare, aging, eating healthy, um, exercise, stress, sleep, whatever the topics are, you can kind of pre-select those. And then you could go and read some articles about them or listen to some podcasts or watch some videos and um, take notes and maybe uh, highlight some good vocabulary that you can use. And then you want to bring it together. You want to practice brainstorming a little bit because I tell students they need to do two types of practice. First type is quality of response. And the second type is timing. Mm. I call it, these are things I just made up, but the quality of response is where you're improving the quality of your response. Mm. So no, you don't really have time to brainstorm on exam day or read all these articles. That's what now is for mm -hmm. so that you feel more comfortable with the topics you develop your vocabulary you practice applying them using a structure through brainstorming mm -hmm. so i recommend doing that and then actually practicing the prompt and do it more than once because um if you say if you if you answer a prompt on like uh what things do you do to stay healthy and then you use some of your vocabulary you're going to say it one way, but then if you do it again, you might change it a little bit differently or use different vocabulary, but you're going to feel more comfortable talking about it. Mm -hmm. And if you do it again, mm -hmm. then you're going to feel even more comfortable and you're going to recycle that vocabulary so that it's actually staying in your brain. Mm -hmm. So even though it may feel like weird or uncomfortable, you should do it. And one thing that can make you do it is by recording. Yes. And then you can listen to yourself and see like, okay, wait, I've like I have a lot of pauses and hesitations or um, that part didn't sound so good. Maybe I could develop that better. It's just going to give you an awareness of what you are actually doing because you're probably not doing what you think you're doing. <laughs> so I think that that's um, important. And that's what I tell students to do. Although I feel like it's like pulling teeth to get them to do it. Well, we also say the same thing, you know, record yourself, okay. then practice this particular speech clarity element, whatever it is, the, the sound or the stress or the rhythm or whatever, and then in t keep that recording 
in two weeks time re-record because for speech you need to practice for a bit you know um, yeah and then listen to the difference but the other trick is listen to what you've been practicing not everything else yeah yeah you know if you've been practicing speaking about health and the vocabulary and the way that you're structuring it listen to that not whether you sound you like the sound of your voice or yeah. you know what i mean yeah yeah, well, I mean, that's kind of what I do, or, you know, when I was teaching general English, that's kind of how you would do error correction is mm -hmm. like, if you're teaching past tenses, um, then you have them do like a communicative activities, talking about the past, mm -hmm. you're going to take notes only about the past, you're mm -hmm. not going to notice every other error that they have, because mm -hmm. number one, that's demotivating. Mm -hmm. But number two, like the goal of the, that practice is to improve those structures. Yes. So for you, I think that's easy to do because you're usually going to be practicing phonemes or, you know, it's going to be very targeted. Yes. But yes. with IELTS speaking, it's not so targeted because no. you're like, okay, how's my vocabulary? How's my fluency? How's my grammar? Yes. How's my topic development? Yes. But I guess, I guess you could kind of apply that like, okay, my goal is to use this vocabulary or my goal is to use conditional tenses or mm. my goal is to... Uh, improve my fluency mm. so that might make it more manageable so that you feel less overwhelmed mm. with everything mm. <laughs> coming mm. together <laughs> yeah yeah you're listening for those particular yeah 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 that, and then with pronunciation like you said i don't work on it too much um but so that's why we would make a good relationship is because yeah. i could send people to you if they were really um struggling with it but what i usually tend to do is ask them to identify their first language errors of course i can identify them you know for them but if they're preparing on their own then i would say become aware of what the typical errors are in your first language and i think you have some guides yes we that have some, you use yeah. yes yes um, some background so language I would say, guides yeah the first eight things that they yeah. need to do for their particular background language yeah yeah exactly because each most of our errors come from our first language, um, you know, influence. So I would say, you know, become aware of what the typical errors are in your language. Um, and then in, in, you could do this for grammar too, but in reference to pronunciation, and then I would say work on those. And I, I would use, if, if it were something I decided to focus on in class, I would do minimal pairs. So if it were like the BB sound in Spanish, for example, I would do minimal pairs with that, um, where you're comparing like very and very. And, um, you know, we talked about that on the podcast. And so I would have them first practice how you do the B, how you do the V, then the B sound, then the V sound. And then I would have them go through the list like this. And then I would probably have them read like a tongue twister. So either I would create a tongue twister for them, or I would just say, look for like a BV tongue twister online because they have them. Mm. And then I would say, you know, you just have to practice on your own mm. um, a lot. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and, um, you know, I think accent is one of the hardest things to um, improve. So kudos to you for working on that because I usually give up <laughs> after <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. And I'm surprised when they improve too, because we have such a short period of time. Yes. Um, but I told you I had that one student, John Carlos, who was very good at uh, his, like, he was so dedicated. Everything I told him to do, he would go do it. And I remember we worked on, um, I think it was the E, eh, like España, Spain mm. sound. Mm. And, and he went back and he worked on it and he came back and he didn't make any errors in the next class with it. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. wow, great yeah. work. <laughs> yeah. And they were, they, if you do it consistently every day, every day, you can actually move it quicker. Yeah. 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 So yeah, yeah. Well, you're the expert in that because no, 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 I, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, I know how yeah. hard it is and yeah. it, it takes a long time. And usually yeah. with IELTS, you know, there isn't that much time. So unless it's something that is um, really impeding listener comprehension, which is what is going to bring the score down yeah. and I don't really work on it. But if it is impeding listener comprehension, meaning you know, I don't understand what you're saying because of that. Yes. And I'm very good at understanding different accents. Um, then it's really a problem uh, yeah. that does need to be addressed. And in that case, I would probably send them to you. I would say, okay, you need to speak with Esther. She can help. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but actually what you were saying before about being 
I call it being succinct, but you, you, you know, you get your vocabulary, you get your structure, you, you know, all of that. It's, and that I've seen it with others. It's really great what you're saying about practicing it over and over, because it's the same as if you and I give a speech yeah. in your own language. You know, you do practice it, you, you tweak it, you make it more succinct, you make it clearer, you make it, yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah. yeah, well, I gave, I just did a couple of presentations and both of them, I ran through the presentation two or three times first, just to feel comfortable with the content. But the reason that I make people do that is because of my own language learning experience. When I was um, taking Spanish class at university, um, I had a teacher who made us give a presentation and he put us in, uh, he actually made us stand in different corners of the room. And then he gave like groups of three students that kind of like circled through each person. So when it was your turn, you had to give your presentation like three times. Wow. And before you did it, you were like, there's no way I can do this. And then at the end, you're like, I think I just moved up a whole new level because just doing that a few times made you feel comfortable with the content, with the vocabulary, with the fluency, with the grammar. And it just made you feel more comfortable yeah. with what you were doing. And it, and for me, you know, only learning in a classroom at that point, that made me see that I actually could use Spanish. Mm -hmm. And it kind of made me see that you can jump ahead very quickly. Mm -hmm. So that experience is very easy to apply to speaking prompts mm -hmm. for me. And I, and I, and I really see the value in doing it. No, I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's really great. Um, just to finish off, and, and thank you, this has been so good because, yeah. because you know, we do get, we get people often um, who, as I said, want to do an IELTS or a PET. There's some university entrance thing here called PET or whatever. Um, P, is it PTE? Well, it's maybe PTE. it's PTE. Yes, I got confused. Yeah. <laughs> it's PTE. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but there are all manner of them, yes. So we do get mm -hmm. people. Um, from that point of view uh, as well. So this has been really good material yeah. for them. Thank you, this has been so oh, good. good. Yeah. Oh, I um, love talking with you all the yeah. time, so yeah. we can do more in the future. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> now, just to finish off, where can people find you, please? <laughs> Okay, so people usually find me in two places, um, either just directly on my website at kristinespinar.com, and that's where you would want to go if you want to download any of my freebies or find out more about working with me. And if you want to just get started on some re free resources, I would say look for my podcast. You can find it on my website, but it's, I think it's easier to listen on podcast apps. So wherever you listen to podcasts, you know, Apple Podcasts, um, you know, any of those like podcast apps, Podcast Addict, CastBox, wherever, or just Google it, um, you can find it. And there are a ton of episodes that really address a lot of the things that I work on in class with my students. And I think that that's a really great place to start. Great, so. great. That is so fantastic. And thank you so much for being with us today. I'm sure yeah. everybody got a lot out of that. And, mm. um, and bye for now. Yeah, thank you so much yeah. for having me. Okay, bye. Bye. bye.